righty. Well, welcome to the Ohio Statewide Family Engagement uh, Leadership Summit. Uh, we are glad that you could join us on this day of professional learning meant to take family, school, community partnership to the next level. My name is Kelly Bussell, and I will be the session's moderator. This is session two, Collaborating to Transform and Improve Education Systems, a playbook for family school engagement. Um, if you have any questions, concerns, or technical difficulties, please chat with me privately. Um, otherwise, Dr. Emily Markovich Morris and Claire Sukumar will be leading the session today. Dr. Markovich Morris, uh, would you go ahead and introduce yourselves? Yes, and great to be here and welcome everyone and thanks for joining. I'm Emily Markovich Morris at the Brookings Institution, the Center for Universal Education, and I'm a fellow and scholar there and lead our team on family engagement research. I'm here with Claire Sukumar from our team as well, who joins as a research assistant. I should also note I am a faculty member at the American University School of Education and adjunct faculty, as well as a parent teacher organization parent as well. So I wear many family engagement hats in my work in addition to the research and work I do with institutions around the world. Um, I'm gonna let a couple more people in and then we can get started with our presentation on family engagement. And I was noting to Kelly right before we started that we are also simultaneously kicking off the United Nations General Assembly today. And education is a big topic globally on the United Nations Summit and family engagement. It's one of the first times I think that family engagement has made the summit and the conversation. So that starts today as well. Um, so it's a very good day to talk about family engagement with Ohio as well as globally. So Claire, if you can take us. So I'll be talking about transforming education systems through family school community collaboration and our ongoing work at the Brookings Institution. But before I even get started, I wanted to just hear from you. And in a few words, five words or less, please write why family engagement is important to you. So I'm gonna pause and ask you to use the chat and write five words or less. For those of you that are just joining, we're starting off our conversation with five words or less, writing why family engagement is important to you. So thank you for those who have started to put some thoughts in the chat. Give another few minutes for people to put their ideas in. Excellent. And for those of you just joining, we're taking a few minutes before we start our conversation to put five words or less why family engagement is important to us. Excellent. About 30 more seconds. So I'm seeing family engagement is important to us, inclusion, empowerment, opportunity, equity, connections, relationships, family support, transforming our communities, engaging families, equal student success, buy-in, student success, helping whole families succeed, collaboration, relationships, inclusion, equity, support, overcoming barriers, access to resources. So all really great words to really encompass why family engagement is important. And if you're just joining, please feel con to continue to write in, in the chat five words of why family engagement is important to you. And I'll continue. Our objectives today are really to talk about the research and work we've been doing at the Center for Universal Education at Brookings on family engagement. And then I will discuss, we'll discuss some parents and teachers beliefs in education and hear from you. And then finally, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our family engagement work and our methodology and tools at the Center for Universal Education and um, some things at your schools and takeaways for each of you for our objectives today. I'm going to start by talking about our research at the Center for Universal Education. For those of you who are not familiar with Brookings Institution, we are a nonpartisan think tank or research institution. We're based in Washington, D.C., but we really work globally in countries around the world and in the United States. We are policy oriented and we focus on making sure we have easy, free to use tools for researchers, for educators, for policymakers, for practitioners across topics and geographies, 
And one of our big areas is family engagement. We are equity focused, so we really look at how to help all young people develop skills to thrive. One of the entry points for us at Brookings was thinking about family engagement is for many of you, I'm sure have this resonates is during COVID, it was an important opportunity to shift how we approach family school and community collaboration. And so with our research and talking with the communities and educators around the world that we've been working with, it, there was a collective call to really let's think differently about how we see and do family school community collaboration. And so we were already working in family school engagement, but we started to really dig deeper into what does that look like and how do we develop more collaboration in the long run? And speaking to many of the words that each of you contributed in the chat, really looking at issues of equity and inclusion and removing barriers and how do we do that in the long term? In our initial research in the first three years of our work, we were seeing that schools were really also wanting to respond to the moment. So in eight of the nine jurisdictions or the schools around the world that we were surveying teachers and, and parents, we really found that teachers reported they planned to engage differently. So there was a call not just collectively as parents and teachers and educators around the world and policymakers, but also teachers really wanting practice to change and do things differently during these closures. And so this was an important opportunity to dig deeper into the research and imagine how do we do things differently. At the Brookings, we have been working for the past three years on pulling research together from across the world, listening to educators, listening to researchers, listening to policymakers, and putting all this research together into what we call the playbook. Our playbook is a, is a culmination of research, but it also offers insights on the benefits of family school and community engagement, includes research from around the world, and it provides real world examples and tools. So there's case studies of different countries, different school districts, different efforts happening, as well as uh, tools for educators and for school districts and school teams to use towards increasing family school engagement. We'll make sure to put in the chat, the link to our, our web, uh, website and to the playbook. And also just a note, if there are those of you that also want hard copies, you can also be in touch with us um, via the email that we provide at the end, and we can also provide those as well. How was the playbook developed? So this large uh, three years of research in the first phase, how was it all developed? Well, it was really collaborating teams, 49 organizations across 12 countries that helped um, really get this research going together. And collectively, we worked with surveying parents, so over 24,000 parents through focus group conversations, talking to teachers, over 6,000 teachers around the world, as well as focus groups. We're currently working with a sample of students, 14 and above, about their experiences with family school engagement, as well as talking to decision makers and those that are involved in national policy conversations and implementers, community organization, nonprofit, non-government organizations that work on family school engagement, as well as academics and literature and research. So really culmination of a lot of players that came together to help pull in and talk about family school engagement. The playbook was really developed with the oversight and support from what we call the Family Engagement and Education Network, which is a team of 50 project collaborators. So some school districts, school teams, as well as community organizations, policy teams, from around the world that we meet four times a year and really dig into um, topics on family school engagement and working groups on how to create tools and conversations that really reach and support education and family school engagement around the world. It's a large network. And we came together and really defined what do we mean and how does family engagement support teaching and learning? And so many of you in the, in the chat at the beginning in, in your words about family school engagement mentioned outcomes and student success and other pieces of success. And we really thought improving the system and thinking about attendance and completion and how does family engagement support attendance and completion, but also the learning and development outcomes of students, including academics, socio emotional, civics, other areas. How do those help improve the system? How do we engage family engagement in supporting outcomes of students, but also how do we think about transforming? redefining the purpose of school for students and for society and taking 
taking the moment of COVID and a challenging moment to really think about how do we transform the system. So these were our really overarching goals and thoughts as we put together the playbook. The playbook really highlights a lot of different research from different um, topics, but really some of the key areas are looking at how relational trust predicts learning outcome. And we know from the research that schools with strong relational trust between families, teachers, administrators are 10 times more likely to improve student learning outcomes and other measures. And also strong relational trust between families and students and teachers is more predictive of learning outcome than socioeconomic status, according to one study. And we'll talk a little bit in, in about what is relational trust and how are we defining relational trust and why that's so key to family school engagement. But the literature also pointed that family engagement can and communicating with families can be a very cost effective approach. And there is literature also that talks about how family school engagement can really make or break for reforms, which we've also seen across the United States um, in the past years as well. And that how aligning and, and misalignment of beliefs between families, teachers and administrators is a top barrier to successful reforms and how critical it is to to talk about purposes and beliefs on education in order to talk about reforms and transformation of education systems. So these are some of the big topics that the playbook highlights on family engagement. And we also dig into some of the barriers as well in the playbook. So we look at lack of personnel, training and support, both at teacher training institutions, at uh, education offices, community offices, school offices, but we also find a barrier of leg the legacy of structural oppression, gender, race, ethnicity, language, other forms, disabilities um, of structural oppressions that continue to serve as a barrier to, to effective family school engagement. We also found across the world, attention to funding and research on family school engagement is an area of, of dire need of, we need more attention to family school engagement, both at policy level, but also in research. And as noted today at the beginning, for those of you that are just joining, today is the start of the United Nations General Assembly in New York. And it, there is the Transformation Education Summit happening and is opening today. And family school engagement is on the agenda for one of the small piece of the agenda, but on the agenda for one of the first times. And so we're really excited also that um, today is also a marking of larger global conversations on family school engagement as part of transforming education. So when we were working on the research and working with teams in our family engagement network, one of the things that really emerged was the importance of talking about family involvement versus family engagement. And our, one of the teams at Kidsburg in Pennsylvania really helped put together what does this look like visually. And so family involvement, as we see it, is really leading with the mouth. So telling parents what they need to do, communicating them, telling them about back to school nights, telling them what they need to bring for their children. But really family engagement includes listening and leading with the ears, hearing what parents think and feel. Um, so listening to parents being key versus just telling them how they can contribute to the school. And really shifting from this idea of that we're serving parents to really we're trying to gain partnerships. And that word of partnerships and collaboration is one that uh, many of you put into the chat at the opening of this session on what is family engagement to you. So we really are trying to pull, pull into and push um, family engagement and, and help schools and districts and policymakers and teams help think about how to shift practice from family involvement to family engagement. I'm gonna pause and just, I wanna hear from each of you and we are gonna offer a poll and ask you um, one a trivia question. What percent of US states do you think require learning about effective family engagement to become a teacher? And then the, uh, the other question is, do you think families in your schools are more involved or engaged? So I'm gonna pause and launch a poll for each of you to take. All right, I'm gonna end the poll and share with all of you. And hopefully you can all see the poll. Claire, if you can just let me know if you can see the poll. Excellent, so what percent of states? So most of you said less than 25%. We found that it's about 30% of states, um, including states and territories require 
some form of family engagement in, in teacher preparation. So roughly around 30%. And most of you thought that fam that your families and your schools are more involved and engaged. And so by 64% of you thought involved, 8% and both, and, and some of you neither engaged or involved. And I think that this really resonates around the world. We're seeing that most schools, most educators are saying our parents and families are more involved and we want to shift more into engagement and thinking about how to collectively doing that. And that's where, again, where our, our work at the Brookings really is helping shift involvement to engagement and using research for practice. I'm going to stop sharing. Now I'm going to move into discussing parents and teachers' education and beliefs on education and some of the ways that we lead discussions and, and use the research to support shifting from involvement to engagement. Some of the top insights that we really learned from parents and teachers in our first phase of research was to, in looking at the culmination of parents and teachers and educators around the world is we found that different communities have different purposes on the beliefs of education, on the beliefs on the purpose of education. And that probably as educators um, is not surprising to you, but defining that and really naming that, that different communities have different ways of believing and thinking about the purpose of education and how to, and how to dig into that um, is a critical thing we'll be talking about. We also found that parents frequently think teachers are much more focused on academics while teachers report that they're more focused on well-being and social emotional learning. So there's a bit of a, 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 a teachers and parents being a little bit on a different page global. And this was uh, found globally that that parents really thought that teachers were more focused on academic learning and academic success than, than teachers actually reported themselves to be focused. We also found that more, the more receptive teachers are to parents' inputs, the more parents feel they share teachers' beliefs about schooling. And so there was a direct relationship that we'll talk about between alignment of beliefs and developing of this trust and feeling heard by parents and teachers. We also found that parents' beliefs about school are dynamic. They can change with ch a child's age. So they might at early childhood, early grades, have a, a thought about the purpose of education and a belief that might change as the child gets older and gets closer to um, adolescence and beyond and, and closer to the workforce, for example. We also found that parent sources of information and how they think about and um, conceptualize education and, the, and their beliefs can vary greatly by their education levels. So parents with um, higher educations might get their sources of information from sources like research and other educators, which might be different from other parents that don't have um, the same experiences with schooling and that don't have higher education experience, for example, may also use different sources of information. So understanding where parents are getting their information and informing their beliefs is also really important to the research. We're gonna dig into um, key area one and really how do we look at different beliefs on the purpose of education. So one of the areas that we start out with, and we and I'll be talking a little bit about our conversation tools, our starter tools methodology, and our surveys. But one of the key questions on our surveys when we're working with parents and teachers and students is really starting with what is the most important purpose of school? And we ask this, um, is the purpose to further education, which we classify as more academic success? Is it to develop work skills? more economic outcomes? Is it to be active community members or citizens, so more civic oriented, or to understand oneself, develop social skills and values, socio-emotional? And we also offer the, offer the opportunity for respondents to enter their own purposes. And one of the reasons for starting this is to help start to unpack some of the beliefs on education and on schooling as the research shows that it's really important to understand beliefs before we launch into conversations and building strategies. So I'm going to take just a moment and share another poll for each of you. Um, and I'm going to ask you, what do you think? What is your belief if you had to answer this question as an educator, as a parent? Right, and I'm going to share what your thinking was. And so 
as you can see, and to, to Patty's point in the, in the chat, you wanted all options. Yes, a lot of people put, I want all options. I need all options because all are really important. And I'll talk a little bit more why we we encourage people to, to choose one option. But let's look at what we, we responded. So the majority, 26%, said to further education or ac academic success. But this was pretty close to becoming active community members, to understanding oneself and social skills or values, what we, what we label as social emotional learning. And 15% to a lesser extent more of the economic or to developing skills for work. And 10% um, contributed other. And so this is really a good spread between different different purposes of education. And you can see that even just a, a team of educators, of 100 educators, collectively, we have different views and beliefs on what is the main purpose of education. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about how we work through these beliefs. And one of the um, things we can get into in the question and answer um, is also why, why just four areas on the purpose of schooling, to Patty's point in the chat. So we're going to talk a little bit about how parents and teachers can also have different beliefs on the purpose of school. So as you saw in the poll, we as educators and people working in education have different beliefs and parents also have different beliefs by purpose and school across different countries as well as even within countries. And so in our global research, we found that parents um, in surveyed in Botswana and Buenos Aires, Argentina, found that social emotional was, was the main purpose of school for them. The majority pointed towards social emotional, whereas in Himal Pradesh, India, and Maharashtra, India, they really pointed to civics as being the most pur important purpose of school and building community. And in Cajon Valley, California, and South Africa, the academic purpose and furthering education was really more of the emphasis for parents. And so you can see different communities have different beliefs parents as well as educators. We also start to dig into why parents frequently think that teachers are more focused on academics while teachers report that they're more focused on well-being and social emotional learning. And this has been a common thread in the conversation from uh, Colombia all the way to Sierra Leone, all the way to India and all the way to South Africa and the US. So this is a common thread um, that, it, that we are often finding is this disconnect in focus on academics versus social emotional learning. And so I'll share a little bit more data now on that. In a recent study, we worked with a team in Colombia, across Colombia on, and we call these kind of the belief maps and looking at how to map and show these different purposes of education. We found that parents, which are the blue bubbles, Parents prioritize academic learning or furthering education. So as you see, 48%, the higher blue bubble was parents. Whereas teachers over, if you look at the orange bubble and 48% in the social emotional, they really prioritized social emotional learning. And I should say these were primary and secondary school, high school and primary elementary schools across Colombia. And the the gap between beliefs is really the white space that you see between the orange and the blue um, circles. And so that was one of the questions that they wanted to dig into as a team. Why are parents so focused on academics, whereas teachers are well-being? And what does that mean for parents that want to ask why, why teachers are you so focused on the social emotional part and the well-being and vice versa, an opportunity for, for teachers also to have a conversation with parents, why they were focused and concerned about that for students. So an important place for, for them to have a conversation. We also look at perceptions. So one of the things we ask on the surveys is also for parents, what they perceive of teachers' beliefs and teachers, what they perceive of parents' beliefs. And we also have um, some work with students as well, where students have the opportunity to weigh in on what their parents believe and students have the opportunity to weigh in on what they think their teachers believe. When we asked um teachers to ask for their perceptions of parents' beliefs, they were pretty right on, on target here in Colombia. And parents prioritize academics, as we talked about in the last slide, and teachers correctly perceived this. They knew that their, their parents of their students were really focusing on academic learning, which is why you see the white space is pretty small here. So they, even though teachers had a, more of an emphasis on social emotional, they understood that their parents were, were concerned and interested and focused more on the academic learning. When we asked 
parents, what they perceive of teachers, there's a bigger perception gap. So as noted um, earlier, that teachers were more focused on social emotional learning. But as you'll see from the, the diamond, the blue diamond under academic, parents actually perceive that teachers were focused on academics like they were, which was not the case. So that's why you see a perception gap. So teachers prioritize socio-emotional learning, but parents thought they were prioritizing academic learning. So this was an uh, important opportunity for a conversation for them to talk about and for teachers to share their thoughts on socio-emotional learning and for parents to, to share their concerns and their questions that they had. Going to move on now to talking about relational trust and the relationship between aligning of these beliefs and moving towards relational trust and helping parents and teachers feel they share beliefs about schooling and not always just share, but that they can have conversations about their different beliefs. And we know from the, the research and literature, and I'm sure each of you um, has noted this as well in your practice and your work that trust is built on aligning of beliefs. And we find that when teachers are more receptive to families' inputs and vice versa, that families feel they are on the same page with teachers about what makes for a good education. We also find that building trusting relationships is really key to effective family, school, and community engagement collaboration, and that this trust is key. But in order to get to this trust, we often need to talk about and start with our different beliefs on education. When we talk about trust and what do we mean by tr relational trust, we pull from uh, Karen Mapp and A.L. Bergman's work and really put, looking at trust as four com complete areas of respect. Are we seeking input and listening carefully to what families have to say and vice versa, listening to what teachers have to say? Competence. Are we understanding that um, and thinking that caretakers are doing a good job and vice versa and thinking of parents, thinking of teachers as are they doing a good job? And we also talk about integrity. Do we keep our word with families and vice versa? Do we keep our word with teachers and personal regard? Do we show families that we care about them as people and do we show teachers that we care about them as well? So respect, competence, integrity, and personal regard being key to building this relational trust. Now I'm going to move on to our takeaways and really thinking about considering examining family engagement in your schools and take away um, new, new strategies and sharing some of our opportunities um, for collaboration at, at the Brookings Institution. All right, so I'm going to get into our conversation starter tools, which are our free to use tools that help teams foster these understandings. And I'll talk about what these these tools are and I'll break these down in further detail. Our conversation starter process really involves four key steps and it's contextualization. So thinking about if you are about and thinking about how to shift from family involvement to family engagement and looking for tools and looking for using research to support practice and, and developing strategies for your context, understanding the context is really important, contextualizing and centering in your community. As we found around the world, communities can vary differently on their beliefs and their systems, but also even within communities, even within schools, beliefs and thinking can vary greatly. So thinking carefully about the context is really important. Surveying of parents, surveying of teachers, and in cases of uh, secondary elementary, um, later elementary, surveying of students also can be important. Analyzing these beliefs, reflecting and discussing, having opportunities, building opportunities to discuss these beliefs in order to work towards strategizing and thinking of strategizing, developing and enacting strategies that are responsive to the schools that use evidence and use the experiences of the schools and the goals of each school. I'm gonna talk a little bit about these in depth. When we say contextualize and centering in the community, we mean thinking about education and literacy levels of parents, of families. We think about languages spoken at home, in the community, we think about different, uh, we think about gender, we think about disabilities, we think about race and ethnicity, socioeconomic status, different geographies. So we think about all of these things when we're thinking about how to approach research in a community and really centering research to be responsive to communities. 
in our surveys, as mentioned, we have three surveys that really help triangulate and think about different beliefs from different perspectives, from the perspective of the parent and the caregiver, from the perspective of the teacher and the educator, teachers and educators, including school leaders and school staff and people working in education and students and youth, those that are experiencing education and that are, are the center of our education. And we generally are working with a little bit older students because of the survey methodology. Um, so roughly 14 and above. So surveying beliefs and perspectives, key. And then the next step is, um, is kind of measuring this through the survey. And we have really three key areas of the survey in, in addition to the demographics. This is the beliefs on quality of education. So what education's for, what makes a quality of education, asking questions about how do parents, teachers, and students see actual quality of teaching and learning, what content they should be, think should be taught, and then who and what informs their beliefs on education. We also ask questions on trust. So do they, to what extent do they feel their, their beliefs are aligned with teachers for parents and parents for teachers? and whether or not they feel respected and valued and their input is respected and valued. We also ask about family school engagement, so barriers to engagement and opportunities and ways of engaging unknown at the schools, as well as levels of engagement. To what extent are they involved? To what extent do they aspire or want to be involved? We then use all of this data to come together and have conversations. And so schools organize uh, conversations, looking at the data together. So small conversation groups of parents and of teachers um, that come together and we have some tools to help guide these conversations. But it's really thinking about, talking about, okay, what did we find with trust and, and, and beliefs? What, how do we build trust and alignment? How do we talk about these different perspectives that we bring? We named some barriers in the survey. How do we actually think about breaking down some of these barriers to the points that each of you had in the chat earlier? How do we think about those barriers? And how do we think about building on opportunities that we already had and strengthening those opportunities that we had? Four, we encourage schools and have tools to support schools and communities to really develop an act and strategy. And this might look differently for each community. So we have some communities that are working on very short term. So redefining a family school event, the back to school event or a welcome night, um, but also task force. We're thinking about how do we reshape task force and how task force work together, how parent teacher organizations work together, communication strategies. We have some teams um, working more on medium term. So are we thinking about teacher curriculum at a teacher institution, training institution? Are we thinking about school improvement plans for the year or for the next two years? Are we thinking about how to finance more family engagement, moving beyond just level Title I reporting to actually uh, family engagement as a part and a part of the culture of practice? And then we have some teams that are also working with more long-term strategies. How do we put it on a national agenda? How do we put it on a global agenda as is happening at the United Nations today? How do we talk about uh, funding, research, and commitment to family engagement? So there can be different um, short to medium and long term. And in the case of Colombia, with their data, they have been really trying to work in different pieces. So school teams thought about communication strategies. They all identified they could do better with communication. They came up with individualized strategies for their communities. They thought about reimagining events, but they also started to talk about some of their school frameworks and how they wanted to involve parents in those because those frameworks currently that govern the schools um, don't have parent involvement. So that was more of a medium term that the, the Columbia team, and I should note that there were 41 schools in the sample that are working together. And in October, for the first time, they're really kind of launching family engagement on a national agenda and really talking with policymakers across the country to talk about how do we put it on a national agenda. So moving it to the long term. So that's an example of where teams can come together to really talk about different strategies on how to, how to use the data and support to enact greater family school and community engagement. Finally, and then we'll move to questions and answers and hearing from all of you. As we moved um, from, from all of these conversations and talking about the data, what did we find, the different beliefs, how do we actually develop strategies? And as noted, there can be short-term, medium, long-term strategies, all very critical and important pieces. 
Um, and so we have on our website a strategy bank that really organizes some, and we've been collecting strategies around the world. Um, and some strategies take place in the home or school or community or school system. And we look at different strategies. Are those strategies for building and providing information and communication? Are they for building relationships, shifting mindset, building skills, providing resources, or or really designing and thinking about how to design differently? And so all of these different strategies, we try to also connect uh, teams that are looking for a certain strategy. For example, we had a team in in Mexico that was looking for a strategy, connected them with some strategies from Argentina and from Colombia. We have a team in Zanzibar, Tanzania, looking for some strategies, connected them with some strategies from India. We have teams in California, connecting them with teams in Pennsylvania. So also making these connections to share different strategies on what has worked for them is part of our work at Brookings. And finally, so our strategy bank really looks like this when you go to our website, it's 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 growing, but here are some of sort of the initial strategies we've collected from around the world. And I'll share two quick strategies with you before I open up for conversation. One of the uh, strategies that came that teams in Pennsylvania have been using, teams um, have been talking about in different parts of the U.S. as well as globally, is poverty empathy simulations that Cajun Valley, California has been using. And what they really do is at their 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 staff meetings and uh, family nights, they really create these opportunities um, during two hour, predominantly during two hour staff meetings, followed by an hour long debrief. They allow teachers and principals at participating schools to really understand what it would like to be and live in poverty for a month and to experience what is that like to, to have to get to school, get your kids to school, show up at school when you're, when you're um, living in poverty. And so during these sessions, parents and community liaisons really share their lived experiences. And the district has really pushed this program and received training on the program from the Missouri Act Community Action Network. Um, and they were using the simulation to really help with staff and professional training, and but really also for educators to understand what families are experiencing. Um, so this, again, is a strategy that's been shared and used in different parts of the U.S. as well as globally, and the intention of really building relationships and shifting mindsets. Another example, very different example, is a fast talk. So this is more of a technology um, program and really it stands for families and schools talk and it's a tool that uses text messaging to reinforce classroom learning at home designed to promote equity and engage historically underserved families in their learning provides regularly accessible information about children's learning um, and so three times a week teachers will send parents updates reminders but not just reminders activities ways that they can engage in learning um, and messages can be translated into more than 100 languages to ensure that families have access to different languages versus just sending messages home in English. Um, and so there's also a clear two-way communication channel that, that parents can ask questions, that teachers can ask questions, and vice versa. And so this was a technology um, solution to really providing information and providing resources that one of the teams shared. So we have reached kind of the end of the presentation, and I know there's some questions developing in the chat. Um, <clears throat> I want to just give you a moment. We'll open up to questions and answers, but I wanted to just give you a moment to, to pause and reflect. There's a lot of information, so if you can scan this QR, I'm just asking your three, two, one. So three things that you've kind of thought about or learned, two things that you really still want to learn about, and one suggestion you have. I'm just going to give a pause for you. Um, to enter that information and then also think about entering entering a question in the chat or we'll have the opportunity to ask live questions. So I'm gonna pause here and give you a few minutes. All right, I'm gonna open it up so we have time for at least 15 minutes for conversation. Um, so I'm gonna start, I can, ask questions in the chat, but please feel free to unmute yourself as well and to ask questions. For those of you asking questions about getting the slides, there will be opportunity on the website for the summit. And uh, Kelly at the end of this session will provide the link for where you can find the slides and we'll also include in the slides links mm -hmm. where you can find our information as well. So yes, you will get information on um, how to get to the slides and how to get to our website. Mm -hmm. yeah how to access the information. Um, 
I think I hear someone talking. So if you have a question, if someone's trying to ask a question, feel free to ask the question. Or we have one in the chat. I can also start. How long can the session will be? All right. I'm going to start with um, Doug Shoemaker's question. It appears that, or a comment, it appears that engagement efforts have to be organized and sustained over time and have a real impact. Just going ad hack by teacher or building will not be enough for district-wide impact. And I think that ha is a really important key area that we have found that with, um, and we spoke to two superintendents and principals yesterday about their ongoing work in Pennsylvania with family engagement and their experiences. And that is exactly what they said, echoing Doug's point, is that they started out with really thinking about events and reimagining back to school nights or one-off events, but one-off events didn't build really the engagement. It was really building this into a culture of practice and really thinking about this as a culture of practice that shifted towards more of the engagement. But it takes time. So they started with these short activities that they collectively designed through what they call design sprints and really enacting an innovative solutions, but started to work towards, okay, how do we do this even deeper as a part of our culture? So that's a great, great point. Um, Nikia has a question about what is the best strategy that works according to your data and experience? And I think uh, my response would be, well, what is the context and what is the need and what are the barriers? And barriers can be similar across districts and, and communities and schools, but they also can be very unique depending on um, experiences with schooling as well as demographics and, and schools. So I think the best strategy is one that is responsive to the data and to the community and one that really thinks about, okay, what are the barriers? What are the opportunities? But are, what are the, also the beliefs and how do we build on those? And I, and I think what we found is sort of the, the most meaningful strategies and those that can be sustained are ones that really respond to the context and think deeply about the context and that really are inclusive of different um, perspectives and trying to reach, um, especially families that often feel they don't have a voice or not comfortable with engaging with schools. And that I think across schools and how to engage and how to build strategies has been key to all of this research. So that would be kind of my response. The best strategies, ones that reflect the context, but also that think and are designed to be inclusive, intentionally in, uh, listening to seeking the, the beliefs of parents and families that often don't feel welcomed or don't feel they know how to engage in schools. Thank you. Any other kind of questions or thoughts or sharing of your experience? We have another question from Brett. What have you found to be the most important questions to engage parents in conversations to increase, increase engagement? We have found that the beliefs is an, is an important stepping ground um, I was, I just came back a few weeks ago from a large cross, uh, national study in, in Tanzania, in Sainsbury, Tanzania. And one of the things also that we heard from parents is, um, they just being asked their beliefs and their thoughts on education was a huge starting point. As one, uh, parent, a couple of parents said, you know, I've never been called to school except for punitive reasons or because I'm afraid my child is failing or because I'm concerned. And so for being called to ask for your beliefs and your thoughts um, is also an important first step. And so surveys don't help us understand the narratives and the experiences of families in complete, but they're a starting point to start to have a conversation on beliefs and recognizing that we can have different beliefs. So we have found that beliefs is an important place to start. And to the point earlier, we often, we might have wanted to check all four areas of the beliefs, the academic, the social emotional, the civics, and the economic, and we really help uh, think about these as, as choosing for one, because it helps us really target the conversation. If we say something like lifelong learning, we have to unpack what does lifelong learning mean? Do we mean that from a more economic, professional development? Do we mean that as, as a joy for learning, as more of a social emotional aspect? Do we mean lifelong learning of continuous across? So getting, um, getting people to define their beliefs and helps them also think about how they approach it. And we find that, you know, asking uh, parents and teachers to narrow and, and students to narrow also helps to have those conversations. If we choose everything, it's hard to have an entry point for a conversation. Although 
you know, most of the time we don't fit into one box, but it does is a starting point for those conversations. So we found that that's important, but we also talking about the other and what does that mean also helps um, unpack what we mean by that. Um, also questions on relational trust. We found that always, I don't think there's been a case in the, in the 40 to 50 schools that, and, and districts and countries that we've worked with. I, we have yet to find where beliefs, alignment of beliefs and the feeling of your alignment of beliefs and relational trust is not highly correlated. To feel that you're, you're being respected and your input is being, it values, it, it matters, alignment of beliefs is key. So asking those beliefs and alignment are really key, but also really unpacking the barriers and opportunities is key as well. Um, student information, we've had uh, student information from South Africa, Ghana, India, and, and Tanzania, and it's really important also to understand student voice, especially, um, you know, their fears and thoughts and beliefs on education. That's been an interesting part of entering also student voice. We often just send a, a general survey to the parents and leave it there um, or send teachers a survey, but we often don't bring these into conversation, and that's really key as well. Um, so I'd say that's an important, I'm just going to try to keep Addressing some of the questions, um, Francis's question about what do you think will be a good strategy to start point fam engaging international families? Um, so one of the schools we talked to yesterday that's been also tackling this question of how is understanding that families bring their own experiences. And so maybe this is their first time in a U.S. education setting in a school. And so for them, how do we how do we understand and value that they have a different experience? They may have come from um, a, a system that is very academic learning focused, and then they're jumping into a school that is focused, for example, on civics learning or socio-emotional learning. So giving them the opportunity to ask that is important. Um, as one of the schools that I've been working with um, on a parent teacher is also this uh, anxiety that parents have of coming into a new system and they want their child to succeed academically in a new culture, in a new environment, a new language. They're really interested in academic learning and having their child do a lot of the social emotional learning can be anxiety producing for them because they don't understand exactly um, how that fits in, what they're supposed to do. They feel like they know how to do the social emotional learning part, but they don't know the academic part. And so helping them see that those work together and that academic and academic success is, is linked to social emotional learning and helping them understand what they can do to support academic learning we found is really key as well. And that how do parents um, coming from different experiences, but first we have to also understand that parents are coming from these different beliefs and perspectives and they have their own experiences. And a lot of parents have their own um, often traumas with education and their own negative experiences. So how do we create that? Um, is part of that and understanding these different barriers. Also, I'd say from the surveys, understanding where they're getting their information. And oftentimes we find with fam some families, especially when they're new to the U.S. systems, they're getting their information from their own child, right? They don't necessarily have the networks to get information about schooling. So they're getting it from a child and maybe another family that they meet. But there's one um, school we talked to this week that's creating a mentorship program for new families not just newcomers to the U.S., but new families in general, even from you know, multi-generational um, to communities about how to, to link with families that have really navigated the education system. And that mentorship is important to families as well. So we found that's key. Um, to Carrie's questions, have you found that teachers are not comfortable contacting, engaging, and why do you think that is? And I think that really depends. We have had a lot of teachers say, Yes, I'm not, you know, I, I, uh, I don't always know how to engage families. As we know, um, you know, 17 out of 56 um, states and ter territories in the U.S. really talk about and tackle family engagement in their teacher training preparation. So not all teachers get that during their teacher preparation, and they don't always know how to engage with families, um, especially working in multilingual, multicultural environments, working with students with disabilities. And so I think we've found that coaching and mentorship and conversations also help not just families feel welcome, but that teachers are also empowered to have these conversations and approaching these conversations. Um, one superintendent said to me through their ongoing family engagement work yesterday that teachers also often were cringing at the thought of, oh gosh, I have to engage families, and now they're actually excited about it. So it's also creating these opportunities that are not centered around punitive and that are not centered around sort of just student uh, 
success, but also br bringing cultural um, conversations to the table, community building of conversations is really key. To Fran's question of what strategies have you used that you found to be particularly cost effective? Um, so a lot of schools will start with smaller strategies, thinking about communications and systems that they already have. Um, but it's also sometimes re-envisioning the way that we already do things. And so those can be cost effective, um, starting with that, but also really building into the deeper, deeper practice. And we found that, um, engaging families is, is critical because in order to, to help and support students, which is at the key of what we are all doing as educators, having family schools, communities work together is, is better towards success. And so I think it's cost effective balanced with how do we ensure that success um, for children and for families is at the core of what we are doing. Um, I can share some kind of more um, research on sp specific cost effective, but it really depends also on the, on the community and the school. Um, why do you think that requirement for family engagement for teachers is only 30% in the U.S.? That's a great question, and maybe some of you have, so if you have thoughts on that, please enter it in the chat. Um, I think from, from humbly working in education these last few decades, I have seen it increasingly on the table at teacher training institutions and, and, and professional development, but I think it, it hasn't gotten there where it's, it's sort of an accepted and systematic part of teacher training and practice. And so we've been talking to school of educations around the world as, as well, and that's a true not just in the U.S., but that's also globally. So it's also how do we bridge this link from having national requirements and, um, to also building this into teacher preparation practice, knowing that uh, teacher preparation is often very, um, has a lot of content and a lot, and how do we integrate it into what we're already teaching in School of Education. But if you have other thoughts, please feel free to add your thoughts. I know we're getting close to times. So we may not get to all questions, um, but Mary Beth's point, with teachers, at least with the U.S., it's not valued by the principal or districts being engaged, comfortable reaching out to parents. Yes, and we've been finding that to be the case and really key of also getting educator leaders to take the surveys on their own beliefs and thinking about relational trust and are really, are they thinking about trusting their teachers, trusting their families as well. And so I think that's a key point of how do we also build principals and districts um, into this as part of their, their norm and their culture of practice. Great point. Are there classes that colleges are adding regarding family engagement for upcoming educators? I think there are. Um, I'd have to dig into sort of where those are happening. If you know some, please enter them in the chat or we can follow up later to us some ideas of where um, family engagement is in in colleges and teacher preparation. How are effective mentoring of parents best identified? So different schools have different approaches. Some schools are just asking voluntary for teachers that have navigated the system that feel comfortable. And there are some schools that have said intentional is really important because, for example, trying to engage in helping historically marginalized families um, or newcomer families, that often takes care and specific um, approaches within. So there's been intentional strategies at schools as well as sort of opening it up to volunteers. But I think uh, schools have said working on mentoring and coaching and, and collectively working with a committee of parents and teachers to organize what is that mentoring and coaching, what are the objectives and how do we do that is really important. Having a committee that kind of looks at the school and what is is the best way to do that is, is one of the things that has resonated. And then uh, Giovanni's point, NASA and Dr. Caps are working on core competencies, yes. Um, so the dual capacity framework from um, Dr. Maps and, and uh, is, is there's, I think there's a new framework coming out if it hasn't come out already shortly. And then that's one of the keys, sort of the dual capacity framework that, that centers our playbook research as well as, as getting schools and communities on this dual capacity and, and communicating and working across. So yes, great point. If you haven't read um, Dr. Mapp's work, really important work. Okay, I know we're at time and I wanna respect sort of the time, but thank you, thank you, thank you for your questions and thoughts. And this was a great uh, thinking and conversation. I'm gonna just share our final slide for us with our contact information. If you wanna get involved, learn more, here are some links 
you will have the access to the slides. Please reach out to us. If you want to join our conversation starter tool survey study, we also have opportunities to engage with schools in the, in the research and ongoing research um, on family school engagement. So please communicate with us and Claire will share her screen of how to get involved as we leave um, you to go on with your day. So Claire, right. go ahead and share your screen. Thank you, Kelly. Yes, thank you. That was awesome. Um, so I provided just a moment ago the link to the summit. Um, you'll notice that every session, there's an opportunity to download each speaker's slides. So that's where you'll find slides for this particular presentation, uh, along with what's available the rest of the day. Um, additionally, um, some folks may not be able to hang out with us the rest of the day. So if that's the case, um, here is a link to the survey for the summit. We ask you only complete the survey once, please. So if, to, if this session is not your last session, wait until your last session. Um, each moderator will be providing this link um, asking for you to fill it out in your last session that you're able to attend today. So had a great turnout for this session. It was awesome. Uh, Dr. Markovich Morris, thank you so much for your time. Claire Sukumar, thank you for your time. Um, and so I hope everybody enjoys this short break and then we'll see you back in the next session. 